sing. Can you move the camera to the next part? You move the camera to the next part again. <clears throat> you move it to the left a bit.
want to be strict about it. <laughs> You shift the camera again. Okay, folks, lecture 18 tells the story of uh, perhaps the greatest medicinal chemistry achievement in history. <clears throat> I think it represents the point where uh, the beginning of rational drug design took over, the concept of privileged architectures and scaffolds for med chem, SAR, 
all of these kind of concepts we take for granted today have their origins in the benzodiazepine story. So the person behind the benzodiazepine story you want to remember is um, a gentleman named Leo Sternbach, who uh, escaped uh, Nazi persecution and uh, had his first uh, job at Roche in Basel. And they shipped him to Nutley to avoid being killed. And the Nutley, New Jersey site, of course, was uh, a site which was uh, pretty well funded and quite productive until they closed it a few years ago. <clears throat> And it basically lived off of the uh, proceeds from the drugs that uh, Leo Sternbach invented or participated in inventing. So he's a remarkable individual. He got his PhD with uh, Rosica at the Eteha. And uh, he started off his career at Roche already in a sort of big way by inventing the first synthesis of biotin. And so his synthesis of biotin was actually used in for many, many years, up until very recently. In st some companies, some parts of the world may still use it. And um, because of that, I think a lot of food industries incorporated biotin for a lot of disorders um, and malnutrition. So he saved a lot of lives just in that synthesis of biotin. And then for a few years, he started working in an area of um, uh, antipsychotics and um, medicines that would uh, sedate people, tranquilizers. And at the time, the state of the art was this compound, Mepobamate. And Mepobamate, when it came out, was a sort of rage of, uh, of Hollywood. I mean, they, they talked about this compound a lot. People would take it to relax. It had unfortunate side effects, and it had a, a tight therapeutic index, so if you took too much of it, it would be lethal. But these, that was a, a, the, the equivalent of today, a blockbuster drug. That was launched in about 1955. And so, in Nutley, uh, Sternbach's group was charged with the task of discovering uh, new tranquilizers. Uh, he's a very interesting guy. Here's his uh, picture. Uh, he, he, he's a real, he's a chemist chemist. So, he came to the lab until uh, way past his 90s. I remember when I visited Roche back in 2005, I met with him in his office. And um, a remar I had lunch with him, a remarkable guy. His son, I believe, was at GSK for a while. He, he still may be. Uh, but he preferred the lab to sort of uh, politics and um, chose his career to be focused mainly on the research. And what was remarkable was that Roche celebrated him. And I, I don't think you see that today. Like, I don't think no matter how well you do uh, <clears throat> in pharma, will a company acknowledge it in the way that Roche did, you know, hiring people to write a book about him naming him uh, U.S. News and World Reports as one of the most 25, 25 most important people to shape modern society. You know, you don't see that kind of loyalty today. Anyway, his story begins in the 50s, and um, it begins with a uh, dirty bench. So the bench top was super, super dirty. He had been working for a few years in the area of tranquilizers, had no success at all, and was basically told to clear up his bench. Now, a bit of a background to this, he has a remarkable lecture that he gave, it was published in J. Med Chem, called The Benzodiazepine Story. And he says here, a chemist with, faced with a problem of this kind, namely to make new tranquilizers, has uh, many approaches at his disposal. In list two, he can start in a rather sophisticated manner with a biochemical working hypothesis with intelligent speculations, or select a more prosaic approach, namely one that's more empirical. And at that time, there, and still today, there's not really good models for, uh, you know, neurological disorders. So at that time, it was pretty much giving it to various animals and seeing what happens. Does it make the cat a little sleepy, or does it make the mouse a little bit impervious to pain? That was basically the recipe. Now, back when uh, Sternbach was a, he was actually a, a lab assistant uh, back in Poland uh, in the 20s, I believe, or 30s. And uh, he had been studying various dye reagents, dye stuffs, things to make colors. And there was this interesting paper from uh, Germany in the 1800s where they made these bizarre heterocycles called heptoxdiazines. And so he had been studying those. And when they started working on tranquilizers, he basically said, well, we need a route that's modular, that we can incorporate a variety of different things. And so the idea would be to make heptoxdiazines kind of like this, where you could 
mix various aryl groups together, put various substituents, and then add amines in there and get them to add in. And it was known at the time that basic amines are good because they have good pharmacological properties. Like this is the level we're, we're talking about. So back to the dirty bench. He had a dirty bench, and his boss has said, you have no results for the past two years. You're a disaster. Clean everything up, and let's just start from scratch, do something new. And um, so that's where they started. Uh, uh, at that point is where they discovered uh, the benzodiazepines. But before I get to that, one thing they noticed about these heptoxdiazines is that they were unusually willing to give up one oxygen atom. So when you treated them with the palladium on carbon or a various deoxygenating agents, the oxygen was removed very quickly. And early on in their effort, they realized that perhaps the structure of these was altogether incorrect. So the structure is totally wrong here. That's surprise number one. There's two surprises in the benzodiazepine story. So what might happen when we treat the starting material oxime with acetic anhydride to start off with? Hannah? Oh, and acetate? Yeah, let's just acetate everything. Okay, that sounds pretty good. So we're going to acetate. And uh, what else can you imagine happening? Anyone? Now I've got acetic anhydride, acetic acid, HCl, the so-called Beckman mixture. Beckman Doesn't happen. Something else first. Instead, we're going to activate that amide we just made, the acetamide. And the structure that we form is something that can lose an oxygen atom very easily. What kind of heterocycle might be very willing to give up its oxygen atom? A uh, perillium. A perillium probably would, just I don't see the dicarbonyl we would need for a perillium. But it's good you said that, Tucker, because in a few minutes I'm going to need your perillium ideas for a different problem. Yeah. So I'm coming back to you for perilliums in a few minutes. Sorry, say that again? You make Vilsmeyer type rea Well, you, you probably would make an activated species here, making this quite electrophilic. That's a good idea. And if that's electrophilic, then you only have one nucleophile left. And if that were to cyclize on there, you would get something that would liberate, in a very rapid fashion, an oxygen atom in the presence of a reducing agent. And that would look like this. So this, folks, oxo, uh, well, you can call these quinoxylines n-oxide, quinoxylene n-oxides. That was the real structure that they were making. So that was surprise number one, that that German paper was totally wrong. And in fact, the entire time they were making these analogs, they were actually making these. That didn't deter them. So what they did is they went back and they said, all right, well, let's put a group like the chloroacetyl and cyclize to these types of compounds. And so this is the wrong structure. This is the wrong structure. And what they were actually dealing with were compounds like this. And when you take these compounds and you add a simple secondary amine, they very cleanly give you substitution there. And they made dozens of these. And they had no tranquilizer capabilities at all. Totally useless. They did this for a long time, had a bench full of misery, cleaned up, and uh, Leo Sternbach's assistant found that there was a small amount of uh, HCl salt of something. And that turned out to be something they submitted to the pharmacologists. I think there's a mistake on here. It should be. They submitted this to the pharmacologists, 
and pretty much got the phone ringing within uh, minutes of getting those results, jumping up and down and saying, my goodness, what is that stuff? It's some of the most amazing stuff we've ever seen. Turned out that that compound was Librium. So when you take this compound and you treat it with methylamine, it does not give the canonical expected product that they had made dozens and dozens of times. But instead, when they treat it with a primary amine, something else happens. So as you can imagine, you can either get displacement here to give you these, or you can get attack somewhere else. Any thoughts why or where that might be, Steve? Probably at the amine carbon. Yeah. So if we attack here instead, you can imagine addition in, and then a one-two shift over, and that gives you that. That's Librium. Well, Librium was a big deal. This compound became very quickly a blockbuster, launched an entire program at Roche, and sort of uh, set the world on fire. It was in all the newspapers. In fact, there's even a San Diego connection. So let me read you this. <clears throat> Preliminary screening showed that Librium was more, much more effective than meprobamate. Uh, that one over there. And the toxicological test showed it was remarkably safe. So animal experiments demonstrated a profound calming effect. In one famous study, Librium was tested on leopards, lions, and tigers at the San Diego Zoo. How do you like that? And the big cats were su successfully subdued. One newspaper headline asked, the drug that tames tigers, what will it do for nervous women? <laughs> It should be pointed out, however, that Roche have never officially marketed the drug this way. <laughs> it was a different era. OK, so uh, things like Librium, Cerax, these kinds of compounds, you see on the front page of your handout, tons of these compounds have come out. Uh, they've been used in everything from sedative to insomnia to tranquilizing capabilities, eclampsia. I mean, there's a probably dozens of things doctors have prescribed benzodiazepines for. So how would you take Librium, which is shown right here, and convert it into Cerax? Using chemistry we learned in lecture one or two. Cheng, any thoughts? Okay, so we could probably use acid, or probably acid is the way to go there to get from the amidine to the amide. But you've got to tell me how I get that N oxide out and put a hydroxy uh, in Cerax. How do I get that thing there? You need one oxidation there, and we need one oxidation to go away from the anoxide. Sarah, can you help them out? Can't hear you. Um, yeah, so Sarah is invoking the famous Bokelhyde reaction. Remember? So you treat that with acetic anhydride of an anoxide, you get the alpha position to uh, shift over, you'll get the acetate, and then you can hydrolyze it to Cerax. If you want to make Valium, all you have to do is hydrolyze and then following that, PCL3 and methyl iodide. And if you all want to experience Valium today, I can do that for you without getting in trouble. I've brought it with me, and you're going to take it. So the doctors say that listening to one hour of Mozart is equivalent to 10 milligrams of Valium. So there it is. Take it in. And uh, after, at the end, at, by, by around 9 o'clock, all of you should be sedated like a tiger at the zoo. And I won't get in trouble. <laughs> okay, so since they figured out what these compounds were, obviously the quinoxaline N-oxide route is a rather laborious way to make benzodiazepines. It's a weird way to do it. And so once they realized what the structures of these things were, they realized they could make these in much easier ways. So the typical benzodiazepine preps you will see 
are pretty much straightforward and kind of obvious. You take your alpha ortho amino ketone derivative and you mix it up with an amino acid, or you take the corresponding alpha halo ketone and uh, then treat that with ammonia. The sort of modern variant of this would be to intermingle with this a buckwell hartwig type coupling. You could imagine that also leading to the, to the benzodiazepines. So the, the synthesis of, of benzodiazepines is not that exciting. Uh, and so what we'll cover today in our case studies are the most difficult and bizarre examples of azepines in general. So they can be, we'll cover oxazepines, we'll cover azepines with two nitrogens in them, uh, but the basic skeleton of what we'll cover today is this. A benzene ring fused to a seven-member ring with some heteroatoms in it. <clears throat> okay, so you, you may all remember Lecture 5. And I believe in Lecture 5, Max was the one who told us how to make a lenzapine. Yes, I remember that. We can go back to the video to check. But... Uh, so, Max, maybe you can revisit your suggestion from all those many, many years ago, it seems like, and tell us how to make C14 labeled lanzapine. Oh, that's sick. <laughs> I, I remember. What do you remember? Milana nitrile for a go wall to make the amino you know, and that just has name. Ah, okay, good, good, good. So, what you remember is making, as I recall, this was. Uh, what you were saying. That was your suggestion from all those years ago, right? Yeah. Um, so to get the label of the carbon in there. Okay. Label sign right there? Yeah. How can we get it? Um. <laughs> what if we replace this with a bromide? then go back to a some sort of Hunsdieker process. So if you have the bromide, you could take the carboxylic acid and you could Hunsdieker it away, like we did with um, in the purity lecture when we exchanged out a CO2 for a BR, and then put the cyanide back in in the form of KCN14. So if you don't remember how to make a lanzapine, go back to lecture 5. We covered it fully there. That brings us to problem of the day number one. Lotrofiban, which is uh, an interesting compound for cardiac indications. <clears throat> and we need a medchem versus process route. So what do you say there, Tanner? You're a medchemist today. reasonable. <clears throat> okay, now we're a process chemist. Who's a process chemist? Anybody want to go into process chemistry? Nobody? Wow. I find that hard to believe.
Zhang. Can you moonlight as a process chemist? Sure. <laughs> now that you're a process chemist, you're going to have to think um, perhaps about the chiral center. Maybe not. Maybe you got a, a better thought. But we, we would probably want to avoid doing a buckwall harwig for a, a molecule as simple on process scale. I'll probably maybe cut the one seven bond. One seven bond? That sounds reasonable. Something like this? Yeah. Something. And then and then asymmetric hydrogenation? Yeah. Okay, how do we make that? Um maybe just cut the A my bond. Maybe not that exactly, because it's like an amino and how high the Okay, so something yeah. like that. Something like that. How about... Uh, <laughs> you like that better? That's our starting material. And so Zhang got in like two microseconds, pretty much a blueprint of what they did. It's a little bit different, but that's it. So let me show you what they did. So they took this compound. <sighs> and convert it into that. How do they do that? Well, first thing we're going to do is uh, methylamine, reductive emanation, reduce down the nitro group. So steps one through three. Step four, DMAD. Those two Michael additions. Now we're going to take this product with the two Michael additions, and we're going to treat it with sodium methoxide. There's your product. Asymmetric hydrogenation done. They do seven steps in one pot, no intermediate purification. What do you say there, Hannah? Did they, is there any way that you could like buy in the chirality from aspartic acid? Yeah, you, you, you know, I think they, they you could, but uh, then the issue is you got to make that NC bond. I and mean, they must have done the calculation and said the price we're going to save by buying our chirality is not as good as taking dirt, mixing it with dirt, and then using it, you know, a tiny bit of a chiral catalyst with. 100,000 turnovers or more. And yeah, but that's that's MedChem disconnection. It's great. And I think you have to do the cost-benefit analysis. Maybe if you revisited it today with more modern almond methods for doing it, maybe it would be cheaper doing it the almond method. Great. Any questions? Okay. How about Pareto benzodiazepines? Can you give me a, a 30 microsecond retrosynthesis of that? Tejo? Okay, I can't hear you. I'm currently getting sedated with the music.
that what you want? That was about 30 microseconds. Great. All right, Tucker, we've been waiting for you on this one. <clears throat> we need to get a label in here. C14 needs to be here. Rather bizarre looking <clears throat> azepine. I mean, the hint is, you got the hint before. You, you said something. <laughs> What's that? Pyrillium. All right, the pyrillium would be where? In place of what? Spit out hydrazine and let's draw pyrillium. So which bond do you want to break? Uh, one, two. One, two sounds good. So what uh, Tucker has done is very quickly get us back to this retrosynthetic disconnection. So this should very quickly turn into that with a little bit of acid. And then a Frito Crafts. with a label benzoate. And that comes from your favorite CO2. Super. <clears throat> and I think this may be the last radiochemistry question we cover in class. You can breathe a sigh of relief. Labeled medizolam is the last one. Nick? You have an answer for us? Um, yeah, so you could disconnect the imidazole from the benzene ring. The imidazole from a, there's not attached to a benzene ring. Oh, you want it right here? Yeah. Oh, okay. And then disconnect the um, CN double bond. Is that what you want? Yeah. Now, tell me, uh, Nick, <clears throat> uh, first, how do we make that? Oh, there is going to be a reduce it. Yeah. Okay. Well, the first issue is we're going to have to do a few steps to make this with hot material. And as you know, we don't want to do a lot of steps with hot material. Ultimately, the ultimate you know, radio synthesis is you install the label at the extreme end of the yeah, synthesis. That's not a good one. Yeah. And not to mention, I don't even care about your regioisomer problems, but they exist. So if this was the only way and you got 10 to 1, they'll scrape out the 1 and do it, throw it in the rat. But the problem here is beyond that. Yeah, so so give us a different disconnection. In that case, we can break the medizole ring first. Where? Why don't you just excise acetate? Yeah, that, yeah. 
get, so that way we'll install the label last. And then we need to use the disconnection that I think Elena taught us yesterday or the other day when we had class. Remember it? Perfect. Yo, we wouldn't call it by you know the imminent oil chloride. <clears throat> yeah. So we can just start from your favorite amide that we just learned about. Standard benzodiazepine. Treat this with POCl3. Add in nitromethane and base. That gets us there. Reduce the nitro. Trimethyl orthoformate and heat. And the trimethyl orthoformate is C14 labeled or acetic acid labeled. Whatever you're labeled, one uh, two carbon precursor is. And you're good to go. Questions? Okay, this is an example problem of the day number two from a uh, 2019 report. So it's all new, never covered before in any previous heterocycles class. And the fun thing about this molecule in problem of the day number two, which hopefully will be a collaborative effort amongst all of you, is that um, the blue bonds are the only ones that you can't possibly disconnect in a logical world. All the other bonds are fair game, folks. I could probably put 20 more arrows there for you. So almost anything you say, I can use. Which ones are blue? What do you say there, Alex? Can't hear you. I can't see which ones are blue. Can you guys uh, zoom in on that structure each so you can see the uh, blue bonds? Maybe Jinjin Jin can start us off. Alex, is it clearer? Uh, yeah, that's good. Thanks. care of that first. Great. And um, we could use a variety of electrophiles. Those are fine. Either one. Now, uh, before you made that disconnection, do you think there were other bonds we could break that might have been strategic? Are any of these candidates to be thinking about a bi arrow type disconnection? Tucker? Pull the pyrazole off. Get rid of the pyrazole. Yeah. Okay. Why don't we get, we'll get rid of that? <clears throat> and let's make R a bromine. Uh. 
Is the bottom one a candidate for coupling? Yes or no? Where are the organometallic people? Lucas, can I can I do a, a, a coupling here? You think so? Can I can I can I do some sort of coupling here? Yeah, Lena says okay. So if she says fine, then it's fine. And uh, uh, Elena, any favorite conditions for this coupling? So you're going to go with a stilly, or they went with Nagishi. So either one is obviously a potent, potent donor. There's a few building blocks we need to make. So how do we make this thing? I think we just learned it on, was it Monday, TAs? It was Monday, wasn't it? So it should be fresh in your mind how to make a triazole like this. Super quick. Deep Tanner knows how. Thank you for it. All right, so this comes from the corresponding H here via deprotonation and then zinc chloride. Now we got our Nagishi reagent. I just need to make the triazole. What's my super quick way to make that? All right, great. And uh, Dongman, how do we make that? Oh, um, just from conversation. From what? Can you? Uh, just from conversation. So, oh, so the isopropyl hydrazine, acetonitrile, gives you nice crystalline HCl salt of that, which you then mix up with trimethyl orthoformate, gives you that, which you then deprotonate with Dewey. Add zinc chloride to make the zincate, and then do the nagishi. Okay, that sounds good. So we have the. Uh, hey, Lena, will the will the nagishi go here or here? Should give you the iodide, right? Okay, so we got good selectivity there. This looks like a really good medchem route, doesn't it? That looks good for medchem. And yeah, what do you say, Cheng? It doesn't. They were worried about that. Okay. It doesn't. Uh, the fragmenting of the organozincs is something you have to worry about mainly with oxazoles and oxidiazoles. Normally, these triazoles and imidazoles, those are fine. They don't fragment as much. But if this was oxygen, fragmentation city. Okay, now we can use Jinjin's disconnection again to get us to... Well, we need to do something before we do that. Actually, we can do that. So just... How do we make that? We need to go back to the Midazole lecture. Tejo, can you remember? What was the easiest, what's the oldest way of making imidazoles? Do you remember? 
Just condensation, that's always a good answer when in a heterocycles class. You can never go wrong with that. <clears throat> yeah, we're going to condense something. What are we condensing? You could use an amine alpha bromo ketone, or you could go really, really old school, 19th century style, and just take uh, the aldehyde, the oldest way of making imidazoles, the way they were first discovered. So a glyoxal, the aldehyde, and ammonia gives you your imidazole in pretty good yield. You then do the double SN2 to give you this compound here. Now we need a way of getting iodination to happen there and only there. How do we do that? Any thoughts? NIS. NIS will give you the diiodo compound very cleanly. <clears throat> CH borylation. Hmm. Maybe. Uh, then we got a boronic acid there. We kind of need an iodide. You want to turn the boronic acid into an iodide? Yeah, maybe. Uh, okay, that's one option. What about, can we use a diiodo compound? So, Tucker, we made the diiodo like you wanted. Now, how do I get that to the product? Reduce it. What, what? Reduce it. How do I do that? Um, Palladium on carbon? No. Yeah. That's going to be a traumatic experience. Tributyl tin hydride. Tributyl maybe. But what's a killer way to make sure you get only that iodide off? Zinc with acid. Treat it with acid? Oh, zinc with acid. Zinc with acid? Maybe. Or what they did was just halogen metal exchange at low temperature and then quench immediately. Okay, let's go back to lecture number one. I think it's one. Maybe two. So this nitrogen here, this CH bond looks like it, this, this CX bond looks like it's adjacent to what kind of heterocycle? What kind of nitrogen is that? That's a pyrrole nitrogen. And that kind of nitrogen is what? It's pyridine or even like, uh, you know, pseudo-enamine-ish type character, so they're much more electron rich. And therefore as we learned about, the easiest CH bonds or CX bonds to metallate or do halogen metal exchange on are the ones that are adjacent to pyrrole-like system. So this one goes first, and then you quench it. Okay, so now we have a good system to make that medchem intermediate. You can imagine this medchem intermediate is glorious because we can do Nagishis here all day followed by Suzuki's there all day. So on the topic of uh, the Suzuki on the top, we probably need to think about how to make that result. We can't leave that behind. How do we make that? We gotta make all the pieces. Well, you, you can't use the 1,3-dicarbonyl with the bronic acid there. So you're going to need to do something a little bit different first. Go back to bromide. Go back to the bromide. So NDS will give you the bromide. Then we just need to make that. And Cheng said 1,3-dicarbonyl, but um, that is potentially correct if you can make this corresponding hydrazine. But what people normally do to install this dimethyl ester group is just treat the corresponding anion, where R is equal to H. With that, terpitoxide, 
yeah, you're looking at it like that's crazy. It works. Works on phenols, works on pyrazoles. They think this kind of crazy SN2 on a fully substituted center uh, takes place through some sort of uh, single electron transfer mechanism, but it does work. I'm not making it up. Okay, so we have a pyrazole, we've got a middle fragment, and we have got our nagishi on the bottom. Is this going to be something you want to do in metric ton scale? No. Nope. So we need something a little bit different. We're going to stick to that Suzuki at the end. We're going to keep that BR here. But we need a different way of installing this grouping here. That's pretty brilliant. So let's draw exactly what he said. That's what you want, Lucas? Yeah, I think that sounds great. So turn this into uh, activated ester, add in that hydrazine, heat it up a little bit, and it will form that after coupling. Great. That's super. How do we make this? back to Hannah because she gave us the answer before on how to make an imidazole. We need a more modern way of making an imidazole. Maybe fast forward uh, about 40 years from this one. Go forward 40 years. You're still in the 1900s. But you said it. Okay, that sounds good. pyruvic acid with that amidine spits out the product. How do we make this? Zeng, you knew I was going to call you on, on, on you for this one because there's a special <laughs> carbon in there. Uh, yeah. What does that carbon look like to you? It's a nice right up. Okay. <laughs> so you can treat. That with terpitoxide, the oxygen will add in, deprotect, it will form the amidine, treat with bromopyruvic acid, and then condense in Lucas fashion, you'll get the product. The last method which nobody suggested, which is also conceivable, is to take the lithiate before you do zincation of that triazole, and instead form an intermediate like this. If you make an intermediate like this, you can imagine it should react pretty well with a compound like that, which is then derived from that. All of these routes that you guys devised were used. The first generation was the MedChem. This is the best for MedChem because we can make 50 million analogs in a minute. The next, and actually for the first tox batch, the process chemists did that. The next route that they tried was the amidine shown here, reacting with this derivative. 
And the problem they had in doing that was in this closure, they had some regiochemical problems, small amount, a few percent was a problem. And then they finally went to the cyclic amidine route shown here, where instead of making a triazole separately, they did exactly what Lucas said, which is make the key, the sort of the ultimate disconnection was Lucas's, where they made this acid, and they realized they could get it from feedstock bromopyruvic acid. And this is the one they scale up to huge scale. Questions? OK, great. Well, we're in the home stretch here. The rest of this lecture is going to go pretty quick. We might end it early. Let's take a look at this BET inhibitor. In here, we have embedded a nice thiophene. We've got a benzoazepine, benzazepine. We've got an oxazole, isoxazole. We've got a chiral center. And we're in medchem mode. So, some suggestions on a disconnection here. Can you Maybe excise we'll the chiral center as an amino acid? What you, as an amino acid. If we excise, that's a good suggestion, Alex. So if we excise the, uh, this is an amino acid. Let's trace out, let's trace out where the amino acid's coming from. We've got that, we've got that, and we've got that. That's going to be some sort of, um, some sort of acid there. Now, the only issue with that, Alex, is we need to figure out a way of taking the CO2, which is on the amino acid, and converting it somehow to the isoxazole. Did you think how we would do that? I'm not sure. Uh... Now, if we take it back, let's go back to what Alex's disconnection would require. It would require something like like that. Is that correct, Alex? Uh, so I was thinking of forming the isoxazole from the amino acid ester and then displacing say, methanol from, uh, the alpha position of that carbonyl you have drawn? So chlorinate here? Oh, I see, I see. You want this. Is that what you're saying? Uh, no, I was thinking like an amino acid, methyl ester, and then some uh, enolate type anion displacing that ester. The chloro on the thiophene? Or how do you, how do you, you know, eventually you're going to have to make this bond and you're going to make a carbon-carbon bond for your, from your ester. Uh, so I'm not seeing how you're going to do that. What's that? It's kind of hard to explain. Um, so... Uh, uh, Can I keep the thiophene? Yeah, keep the thiophene and okay, then good. at the at the five position have. Is this correct? This part? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, good. And then now, what do I do? Put something here. Yeah, alkyl chain with um, some electrophile. So. Methylene. Like that? Mm. And then if you treat this with, let's say, zinc or something, you close it down to the compound I have here. Kind of. I, I was thinking of a way to make the isoxazole directly. Aha. Uh -huh. so well, that's a good, it, it, this is a good thought. 
when you look at this isoxazole, you might just think make, you're, you're sort of struggling to make that bond. That might be a good indication that maybe what you should be thinking about is a disconnection like that. Now, if we were to take Alex's disconnection literally, I think this is probably where it would lead you to this type of species. But the issue with that is you may, during those base-mediated events, lose your chiral center here. So you have to be worried about that. Maybe not. So this is a, certainly what's drawn here is potentially viable. You could take the amino acid, homologate it, and then you've got the bromo, bromo thiophene. Sure. I mean, if you put that on a test, the only potential issue would be your regiochemistry of the isoxazole. And you could make an argument that this is sterically less hindered, and so the nitrogen would go here, and then you cyclize. It, what Alex says is a perfectly viable disconnection. No arguments. Can we use an Elena type disconnection here? So if we do that, what is that going to mean? We excise first, Elena? Yep. Can't hear you. What? Oh, I was kind of following Alex's disconnection. Okay, but if we take a look, a new look at this uh, BET inhibitor, and we use disconnections similar to what you've been telling us the past few lectures, what would be the bond we would, or the arene we would rip off from here? So, on the bottom, right? And we bring that back to an amide. Okay, let's do that. And while I'm drawing this out, I want Patrick to do me a favor and uh, tell us what his favorite medicinal chemistry way of making chiral amines is. All right, Patrick, what's your favorite way of making chiral amines? Quick. With chiral catalyst, well, I think if you were in the trenches, you wouldn't want to use chiral catalyst in MedChem. Like, if I need to make chiral, I mean, if you're if you're a med chemist, you need to make chiral amine. You need to make it like an Evans auxiliary, where you have no ambiguity as to what your uh, chiral center is, and you can easily separate diastereomers. Elman is the way to go. So you can take a molecule like this, you can make the Elman, you can then add allomagnesium bromide to it, get one diastereomer product out after a uh, column. And then when you're ready, whenever you're ready, you can convert this allyl into the carboxymethyl just by oxidative cleavage. And then the Elman amine that you get after deprotection cyclizes smoothly to give you this compound, but of course with the allyl here. Does everybody see that? And then we can use Elena's disconnection, make the imminent oil chloride, and then Suzuki our way to diversity. Now all we need is a synthesis of this compound and this one. Does anybody remember a good synthesis of this one? I think it was problem of the day number two or three in the thiophene lecture. 
what lecture was Thiophanes? Four? Four is Pearl? Yeah, you're right. Five. Yeah, that's probably right. Lecture five. Do you guys remember Silthiofam, that uh, agrochemical agent with a TMS group embedded in it? Do you guys remember that? Sarah remembers, right? Yes. What, sorry? Yeah, that's exactly what they did. Perfect. Brilliant. Yes, the Feiselman. So you can look up lecture five. This is in your notes. And they used that exact preparation to make that. They did the Suzuki coupling, and then all we need to end this is give us a synthesis of that compound. Well, we can do what uh, Tanner taught us a moment ago, excise that out, or keep it in, but probably you want to excise it through the corresponding bromide followed by a meorborylation. And then I need a one-step way to make that. Isoxazole. Now, if you go back to the isoxazole notes, you'll remember that we have basically three ways of making those compounds. Do you remember? What lecture was that? Maybe a 12 or something? We talked about isoxazoles and we had three ways of making them. We had condensation of a 1,3 dicarbonyl. We had oxine chemistry. And then the third one was... So the nitrile oxide plus the propargyl acetate gives you your isoxazole. And if you wanted to be cute, you probably could get away with putting the boronic acid here and doing the cycloaddition. But what they did is they did the cycloaddition followed by bromination and then meoroborylation. And they did their Suzuki coupling. They did the Elman addition, cyclization, and then uh, Imanoil Chloride, Suzuki, and they're done. And this is a JMed Chem paper from uh, ACS MedChem left from 2013. So this is quite uh, relevant. Okay, well, in the final few minutes, let's talk about two ones that are should be pretty quick. So this RAG GGTase inhibitor. So when you see a molecule like this, it's a benzodiazepine for sure, but are, are there some oxidation states we can add to it to make it a little bit even simpler for us? Oxidize the benzoic position. Yeah, that would make us in amide territory. And further, if we oxidize here too, you could imagine making the azepine ring system from something like this. Now, in practice, people don't use this. They use something different. An interesting heterocycle, which uh, surprisingly few people know about. Has anybody seen this before? This is called an isotoic anhydride. And isotoic anhydrides are awesome, because you can take them and directly add amines. In this case, we're going to use the amino acid, tyrosine in question. And amines add to isotoic anhydrides straight at that carbonyl because it's activated internally. And then they liberate CO2. And after cyclization, We end up with this, which we can then reduce down fully to the diazepine. And then the diazepine can be sulfonylated here and then alkylated here. Why does that happen, Chang? Maybe we need to put the board over there. Yeah, one of them is an amine. So you can sulfonylate here first. 
and then after that you can alkylate their second. And that's how they make a trillion analogs. Don't forget isotope and hydrides. And with all of this in mind, uh, you should be able to give us the 50 microsecond disconnection of this next one. What do you say, Max? Can you give us a quick disconnection? sounds pretty great. So you have recognized there's an amino acid built in here, isn't there? Is that what you want, Max? My way was longer, but I don't know. <laughs> well, but what I interpreted you saying was that. Dump and stir, SNAR, reduce down nitro, cycle is done. Then if you want to put your R double prime here, you just alkylate. Happy? Well, uh, we're doing great on time. And we only have three problems a day left. The point of these problems of the day is just to expose you to uh, what is a litany, thousands upon thousands of experiments that took place at Roche and other places. It was a frenzy in the 1950s, as you can imagine, because they struck gold. By today's standards, probably they made hundreds of billions, if you adjust for, current, for the inflation, on the uh, benzodiazepines. And so during this period, there were more than two chem reviews, just on crazy rearrangements in this field. So let's just cover a couple of them really quick. You know, the old benzodiazepine lectures we used to give were basically, I don't know, up to like nine or so problems of the day that were just all mechanism. But people were yawning so much that uh, we decided to truncate it down to just three. Three really cool ones. All right, I assume nobody wants the iPad to do this himself, so uh, that means someone's going to help us through each of these, and the faster you solve these, the faster we leave. Steve is looking at me like I know him right away, so just tell us what to do. Sodium hydroxide adds into the amine carbon. the day number four. <clears throat> Who's going to help us in this one? Tejo, looks like he has it. What do I do? Maybe oxygen. Where's the oxygen? Oxine. Oh, well, oxygen of the oxine gets deprotonated, and then does what?
That's it. Perfect. So it looks like all the time I stole from you over the past quarter is going to be dutifully returned to you if and only if we don't spend 20 minutes on this final problem of the day. So I know all of you got your surfboards ready. You're ready to run to the beach. Who, who's going to make it happen? Jess? Can't hear you. What? 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 Uh, the, the first one is just condensation. Yeah, that sounds good. Just condensation. Great. Okay, we're halfway there. <laughs> that one's easy. What's the other one? That one's a little weird. Isolation, um, bows, uh, N and O. Then I treat it with ammonia. How, what happens now? I'm assuming this is what you wanted. time gets returned to you, so you can't complain to the graduate office. Uh, I'll see you all on Tuesday for a glorious discussion of alkaloid biosynthesis, and then Wednesday we have Martin Neeskate, followed by Rick Ewing, and then Friday, or Thursday, is the uh, game show, where their prizes will be unbelievable. We'll be giving away things you couldn't imagine possible in an academic class. <laughs> we, we won't be giving away a PhD, but, uh, <laughs> but some, some people may leave with a shiny new Tesla. It's possible. Have to arrange, if they deliver it on time, let's see. Yeah, so next Thursday should be quite fun. <laughs>